Hello, let's um, go ahead and get started. It's about a minute after two. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Paul Kelsey. I'm the head of acquisitions and I chair the library's affordable learning committee and I'll be hosting the meeting today. I'd like to also introduce Angela Dunnington. She's head of access services and she's also a member of the committee and Andrea Alexander, who is a new member of our committee and she's an instructor reference librarian. Welcome to today's presentation, Affordable Learning Louisiana, an introduction to open educational resources, OER, and affordable educational resources, AER. So first, um, what is Affordable Learning Louisiana? How do we define affordable learning? It's an initiative to save students money on education by reducing the cost of instructional materials through the use of affordable educational resources. These are called AER or AERs open educational resources, and these are known as OERs or um, OER, and other open access materials. So that's sort of a good working definition of affordable learning. And affordable learning programs are becoming prominent in higher education on the national level. So open education really is gaining traction um, all over the United States and has been for about the past five to 10 years. So it's not just Louisiana. The Affordable Learning Louisiana initiative was established by Lewis, which is our consortium of libraries, um, academic and public in Louisiana. And this started back in 2015 with support from the Louisiana Board of Regents. So affordable learning offers choice, affordability, and accessibility. And really the, the goal of the program is to reduce the costs of instructional materials through open and affordable strategies and Lewis has implemented a number of these strategies um, over the past six years. It impacts student success through access with the goal of ensuring that students have equitable access of, to course materials on the first day of class. And so we all know how important it is that students can um, <clears throat> have access on the first day so that they can succeed academically. And so far, our students have saved a total of nearly $26.8 million with affordable and open educational resources, which have impacted over 249,000 students in Louisiana since 2012. So almost a quarter of a million students have benefited in our state um, from affordable learning. So, you know, we, we ask why affordability? Well, for the class of 2019, borrowers graduated with an average debt of $26,808 in Louisiana. And so that's a, a lot of money to come out and to owe. And one of the reasons why <clears throat> higher education is, is expensive is because of textbook costs. And these have increased a thousand percent since the 1970s. And so there was a 2019 Bureau of Labor Statistics report, and it showed an 88% increase um, just between 2006 and 2016. So for that 10 year period, it rose 88, they rose 88%. So, but here, you know, at Southeastern, we're so fortunate because we have a textbook rental system and you're probably all familiar with that, but, but if you're not, it costs $50 a course, regardless of the number of textbooks required for a course. So, so if you're in a course and there are three different books for a class, you're, you're just charged $50 instead of 150, which is great. So textbook rental um, literally can save a student hundreds of dollars a semester just on textbook costs. And students are not charged the fee for classes without a textbook rental. So, so it's not just an automatic charge um, that, that shows up on their bill regardless of whether or not there's a book um, available. And of course, some books are, are not included in textbook rental or supplemental course materials may not be available through textbook rental. And so these are available uh, for purchase from the university bookstore. And so it's conceivable that, you know, a student could still incur um, some costs for, for textbooks for a class. But I can't really say enough about good, good things about textbook rental because it's um, just been a wonderful program over the years. But, you know, not every university or college is so lucky to have a textbook rental system. And so, so nationally, students are told to budget between 1240 and 1440 for books and supplies each year. <clears throat> and so I was curious what um, UL Monroe was recommending. And, 
they recommended $1,300 for 2021, which sort of falls right in that range. But what studies have shown is that students are actually spending more like $415 per year instead of $1,300 or so per year. So we, we have to ask ourselves, ourselves, why the difference? Why, why aren't they spending the entire amount? And it's because they're coping with the cost in many cases, and, and they use a lot of coping mechanisms to help with that. So, so one thing they might do is purchase an older edition of the textbook, and that wouldn't be ideal if there was an assignment that um, needed the most current textbook. They'll also consider delaying purchasing the textbook. They might be waiting for their um, financial aid to come through or perhaps a paycheck. And, and that can have um, detrimental consequences if there's an assignment and they don't have it yet. Or they may never purchase the textbook. You know, in the past, they may have been in a class that required a textbook and it wasn't really used a lot. And so, so they learned from that and decided, well, maybe I don't need to purchase um, the textbook for this class. But, but that's not an ideal situation, obviously. Or they will share the textbook with other students. Um, and so, the, you know, that can be problematic if, if two or three people are trying to use the textbook and an assignment is due the next day. Or they, they'll download the textbook from the internet and that puts them at some risk because of copyright. So that's not a, a good situation either. So there was a, a student watch attitudes and behaviors survey in 2017 and 18. And it asked students, what are your biggest cost challenges? And so a lot of 61% um, said tuition, and that's not surprising. <clears throat> but what is surprising is that 39% said course materials, and that was um, above housing costs, which came in at 38%. Um, percent. And so course materials can be a significant cost challenge for students. And so there was a really good story on NPR. It's about three minutes long in 2017 about the number of hungry and homeless students um, at colleges and universities. And Sarah Goldrick Rabb was the sociologist who was in charge of the study. And one thing that she said was that they're working and they're borrowing and sometimes they're still falling so short that they're going without having their basic needs met. And so if you have a chance, you know, we don't have time to to listen to it today, but if you have a chance, go in and listen to it because it's a really sort of moving and interesting story and sort of highlights the problem, which is really an invisible problem. You know, you see students in your classroom and you don't think, oh, well, you know, maybe they maybe they don't have enough to eat or maybe they're having problems um, paying for their rent, but it's it's a large percentage of students. And so the College and University Food Bank Alliance, that's an organization of higher education um, institutions that run food pantries. And they started back in 2012 with 13 members. And as of 2019, they had over 700 plus members. So food pantries are really becoming ubiquitous at universities and colleges. And so <clears throat> this is just an article from the Lion's Roar when, when our food pantry opened. And so, so I'm very proud that Southeastern also has a food pantry. So what are the elements of the expense? Well, we know tuition and fees are very high. Also, room and board, <clears throat> books and supplies, and <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, personal expenses and transportation. And so mm -hmm. what, what can we do about this? We can't really do a lot about tuition and fees or room and board, but where we can help is with books and supplies. So why open, why OERs and, and uh, open access materials? Well, first, open removes financial barriers for all students. It also facilitates the free ex exchange of knowledge because this um, is free, there's no cost. It offers flexibility, it gives, it gives more control to faculty because they can create and design their own materials. And sharing is scalable, so so if you create an OER, you can share it with a large number of students or a large number of classes. And a good example of that is the Open Textbook Library, which has a lot of textbooks from um, OpenStax from Rice University. And some of their textbooks get used by thousands of students and, and hundreds of classes, um, particularly the introductory textbooks every year. 
So when we think about open education, open education really supports academic freedom and it does this um, through pedagogical innovation. It encourages that innovation. It allows faculty to share their expertise when they design their materials. And these materials are also open to continuous improvement because if you were to design an OER and you know part of it didn't work well for your class, you can improve that and change it. Or you know somebody else, another professor might come and offer some improvements if that was offered um, through an open license. In terms of affordability, it improves access to content. It also increases engagement because students can um, engage in class if they have access to the material. And it also improves retention because uh, studies have shown that students are, are less likely to drop classes when they have access to these materials. Open education supports social justice and it, it does this by diversifying and ampli amplifying voices. It allows professors to emphasize inclusion and to celebrate diversity and also to design uh, course materials that are culturally relevant. It also supports social, social justice by acknowledging and addressing economic disparities. So a good, a good definition of OER is a resource in the public domain or released with an open license permitting free use, adaptation and redistribution by any person. And so, so these are permissions, and I, I think the most important one, um, as you'll see later during the presentation, is adaptation. So when you think of an OER, think of open, think of free, plus, plus these permissions. And so these permissions are to copy and to mix, to share, to keep, to edit, and to use. And most commonly, OER materials and open access materials are licensed under a Creative Commons license. And this, this license allows for free public access with different levels of permission. And so these are, are listed down here and Angela will be going over these different levels in, in, a, little, in a few minutes in detail. So when we think about OER resources, we, we tend to think more of teaching and learning um, and less than scholarship and research. So it would include textbooks and sort of traditional lessons to engage students. It could include slides or modules and also videos. It could include scholarly articles and books that were um, OERs if they had a, a, a not very restrictive open license. And most of the time an OER is online, but it's important to remember that it could also be in print. So. So for example, if you had an, an, a textbook that was um, licensed with an open Creative Commons license, you could print it out and share that with students and that would still qualify as an OER. So how do you find your OERs for course transformation? Well, there's a really good site that was just created, the Lewis OER Commons, and Andrea will be demonstrating that briefly, which has a, a lot of really good OER material. There's also Blue Cloud Open Access, which is a repository that, that we're implementing here at the library. And then there's Merlot, which is probably um, the most well-known OER repository, and that was created back in 1997 um, at the California State University System. But now a lot of uh, universities nationally are, are involved in that partnership, so that's a great resource. And also the open textbook library and Angela will be showing you that in a little bit. So what are affordable educational resources? So an AER is defined as a single or collection of required materials offered at low or no cost to a student. And this is traditionally copyrighted material. And so, so most AERs won't um, you know, have, have, an a, have a Creative Commons license. AERs are licensed through the library for multiple or unlimited user access. So anything that we have, you know, in our databases, many of those are considered AERs. And so how would you find an AER for your course transformation? So these can include eBooks from our EBSCO eBooks and eBook Central subscriptions, and, and all of the books in those collections are unlimited access. 
also ebooks available are purchased through evidence-based acquisitions programs and we've had a number of those in the past including um, for project news and also streaming video you know we have a films on demand subscription and an avon an academic video online subscription and these would all qualify as no cost to students and also the electronic journal articles we have we have thousands of those available through the through the library that we license and all of those would be unlimited user. And so if you if you selected one of those journal articles um, made available through the library, that would qualify as an AER. <clears throat> so Act 125 SB 117 is new legislation requiring public colleges and universities to use a conspicuous symbol or logo to identify each course in its course schedule that exclusively utilizes AER or OER course materials. And this was signed into law um, by Governor Edwards back in 2019. And currently universities and colleges in Louisiana are working on this requirement, in including Southeastern. And these AER and OER courses will be reported in the Board of Regents statewide student profile system. That's the SSPS. So to qualify for one of these AER course markings, the course would have to have a total cost not exceeding four times the federal minimum wage. So currently um, at $725, $29 is the maximum total cost to meet the AER designation. And so that would be everything that a student would have to pay would have to um, be $29 or less, and that's pre-sales tax. Supplies and equipment, lab fees, technology fees, and testing fees are all excluded. And so, so if you were teaching an art class and you required a canvas and some paints and some brushes, uh, you wouldn't calculate those in the cost. And to qualify as an OER course, these would have to um, exclusively use openly licensed materials permitting free use, adaptation, and redistribution. And again, adaptation is sort of the key word. And of course, the goal is to allow students to identify these courses for potential cost savings at the time of registration. And so you'll see that in our registration system that, that some of these AER and, and OER courses will be marked. So now I wanna circle back to CloudSource Open Access because this is a, a database that we're implementing here at the library and that we hope to promote to faculty soon. This is a pilot project from Circe Dynex, <clears throat> and this will include access to over 6 million OA articles, ebooks, and e-textbooks. This is a single site for high quality OA materials covering a wide range of subjects. So, so no matter what you're teaching, you should be able to find something in CloudSource. It also provides a seamless way to integrate OA and library content into Moodle using Blue Cloud course lists or into any um, learning management system. So this Lewis pilot is available to libraries, um, all of the academic libraries in the consortium and will launch in the, in the coming weeks. And I wanted just to show you um, what our beta version looks like. And so this is our library catalog. And so I did a search under CRISPR and these were delivered in this cloud source open access um, tab, if you can see here. So it retrieved over 7,000 results. And so the second one is from Nature Methods, which is a Springer journal. And so a student or a faculty member could, could go in and view the article and they could also um, get the permalink here. And so, so even though this is delivered in our catalog, we'll also have a separate um, a database that you can just search, just, just Blue Cloud. So I want to mention um, our evidence-based, our current evidence-based acquisitions programs. And so the first is Books at JSTOR, which includes 48,000 eBooks from 91 participating publishers. And these are scholarly um, university and association publishers by and large. And so the way this works is we have complete access um, to this collection through June 30th, 2021. We also have an evidence-based program with SAGE right now. It includes over 5,000 eBooks. 
and will have complete access to this collection through September 29th, 2021. And so these books are all DRM free. They're, they're multiple user and ideal to adopt for classes for summer or the next academic year or, or even beyond. So if you found a book in this collection you wanted to use, um, say, you know, next fall, you could email me that request. And then what I would do is I would, <clears throat> excuse me, I would purchase it for permanent access. And that's based on available funds. And of course we have, we have plenty of money right now. So I don't anticipate not being able to buy any of these. And so that would, if you could email me by May 21st and we'll be sending out a reminder to faculty. And so those are the two current EBA programs that we have right now. And so, so these are great books to adopt. And so since, since we license these materials and we pay a cost, these would not be consider, considered OER materials, but rather AER materials. <clears throat> so I think at this point, I'm going to um, turn the presentation over to Angela. Um, so the agenda for this part is the Open Education Network. And what is the problem we're trying to solve? What are open textbooks? And what can we do? <clears throat> the Open Education Network is an alliance of higher education institutions, systems, and consortia moving open education forward. Some of their guiding principles include the common good, equity, inclusivity, action, humanity, integrity, and shared abundance. The Open Education Network provides the Open Textbook Library, which is a growing catalog of free, peer-reviewed, and openly licensed textbooks. You can explore the library's books to see if an open textbook fits your courses and students' needs. There are now over 869 textbooks in the Open Textbook Library. New textbooks are added on a regular basis. These are DRM, digital rights management free with unlimited downloading. Most are licensed under a Creative Commons license, which typically allows for sharing and remixing with proper attribution. Many contain reviews by faculty members, including 22 by Southeastern faculty members. Textbooks used at multiple higher education institutions or affiliated with a scholarly society or professional organization. There's generally two main questions that we get about the OTL, and that is where do you find them and what are their quality? Only faculty can determine that. So one good place to look is the Open Textbook Library. Here's a screen capture of the Open Textbook Library portal. Notice you can browse by subject, search for new books, or those in development, and search the library in its entirety. Now we'll dive a bit into Open Textbooks. You'll notice the sample on the slide is a physics textbook. Just because a book is open doesn't assume that it comes with ancillary resources because some of them do. The book on this slide was the number one adopted, adopted physics textbook in the nation. OpenStax from Rice University tracks those statistics. This is a two semester book and while it's free, you can also get a print version for about 20% of what a commercial book would be. The book is available as a PDF, EPUB, print, or web version. You can also download this book and others through iBooks. The book is also downloadable on a Kindle device. And third-party vendors like Bookshare provide online service where you can get content converted to accessibility formats like Braille for users with disabilities. Instructor solution manuals are also included in open textbooks. 
as well as PowerPoint slides. OpenStax is the branding of the textbooks published by Rice University. They set out to publish textbooks for the top 25 enrolled courses in the United States. They were initially funded by foundations, but they are now self-sustaining. They publish high-quality, peer-reviewed, openly licensed college textbooks that are absolutely free online and low-cost in print. Now I want to show you the traditional publishing models. The model on the left wouldn't work if copyright protections didn't exist. In the model on the right, books are published this way also have copyright. If the intent is for the book to be freely copied or shared, then copyright isn't sufficient. So we want to give instructors and students the intended rights to copy and share um, an open textbook. You'll see here with the copyright symbol on each slide. Okay. The model on this slide represents on the left what we assume and how we assume all publishing happens. A publisher invests in publishing a textbook. Students buy the books. The publisher makes the money back and a profit. The publisher pays royalties to the author, typically a single digit percentage. On the right side is another model. A college or university publishes a textbook they make, that they may put out by their own faculty members. Part of the funding is paying the faculty up front for their efforts. At times, especially early in the Open Movement Foundation, funding came to institutions outside of the institution from foundations, government, consortia. But they're increasingly now more self-funding these efforts. This model allows the textbook to be free and available to be freely shared and copied. Some other points to make that note that the publishing process can be exactly in the same in both models because it can include peer review and copy editing. So it's impossible to publish a, so it is possible to publish a free textbook while respecting the efforts of the author. Copyright law is extremely important. In many ways, it is not intended to help people who want to share. So it isn't sufficient in cases where the goal is to share. We need a license to let people know it's okay to share the work. Creative Commons is a nonprofit corporation that created Creative Commons licenses to help people who want to share their copyrightable intellectual property and provide universal access to research, education, and culture. So this is known as alternative copyright arrangements. Copyright was created long before the emergence of the internet, and it can be hard and granted for the network to copy, paste, edit, and post to the web. The default setting of copyright law requires all of these actions to have explicit permission granted in advance, whether you're an artist, teacher, scientist, librarian, policymaker, or just a regular user. In order for Creative Commons to achieve the vision of universal access, they must provide public and standardized infrastructure that provides that balance between the reality of the internet and the reality of copyright laws. These Creative Commons licenses provide a somewhat of a revolutionary flexible licensing system that enables people to build upon copyrighted works that legally, that legally and to share them. Authors and creators make known which rights they reserve, enabling free use of works without having to track down copyright holders. Depending on the Creative Commons licenses, you are free to copy, 
share, edit, mix, keep, and use. So when you see these symbols on a work, you'll be able to differentiate between copyright and a Creative Commons license. Obviously, the image on the left is the traditional copyright symbol, all rights reserved. And the image on the right is the Creative Commons um, logo, which means some rights are reserved. And it intends the work to be freely used and shared. A Creative Commons license allows for these things to copy, mix, share, keep, edit, and use. David Wiley calls these rights the five R's. Retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. This is just the different way of saying that a Creative Commons license is available to share. So one of the last things that you see on this model that needs um, includes inclusion is the Creative Commons license which you can see on the textbook logo. This license is preemptive. It puts the book on when it's published, and the license tells us that it's okay to do these things, copy, mix, share, keep, edit, use. So no need to ask permission. The Creative Commons grants the ability to update the content, customize the content, and improve the content. There are actually six Creative Commons licenses. These are made up of combinations of four symbols that you'll notice at the bottom of this slide. By, NC, SA, and ND, as Paul referenced earlier in the presentation. If you understand these four symbols, it'll be easier to comprehend the six licenses. If you want to read about each one in more detail, you can visit the Creative Commons website in fact, if you click on the conditions of use at the, in the Open Textbook Library site, it will take you to the Creative Commons website. Depending on the Creative Commons licenses, you're free to copy, share, edit, mix, and reuse. On this slide, these are all of the symbols and the associations with the six licenses for Open Textbooks. These licenses are listed from the most to the least permissive. The first one is by attribution. This license allows others to distribute, remix, tweak, and build upon the work, as long as you credit the original creator. This is the most accommodating of the license offered. The next one is the share alike. And this license allows reusers to redistribute, remix, or adapt the materials. It also allows for commercial use. The third license is NC, non commercial. This license allows reusers to distribute, remix, adapt, and build upon the material in any medium or format for non commercial purposes only. The next one at the top right is the NCSA. This license allows reusers to distribute, remix, adapt, and build upon the material for non-commercial purposes, as long as the creator is granted um, access. The next one is ND, by ND, non-derivatives. This will allow you to redistribute commercial and non-commercial as long as it's passed along unchanged or as in a whole. And then finally, the last license that you'll see in an open textbook situation is NCND. This, allows, this license allows reusers to copy and distribute the materials in any medium or format in un any unadapted form only. So this is the most restrictive of all the licenses. So what else can OER improve student success? How else can we do that? Well, students are, are most at risk of dropping out of higher education institutions. So we need to see them as belonging to an institution. These students sometimes feel 
and report that it's like an imposter, that they don't feel like they really belong in an educational environment. Even small barriers can be enough to cause them to leave school. Any general improvement we make can help them more in their success academically. So we need to look at ways that open textbooks might be able to remove those small barriers and help them feel like they belong. We need to look beyond affordability and look for inclusion, accessibility, and engagement. On the left, you'll notice an open textbook for a low-level statistics course. On the right is a derivative of the textbook on the left, which includes content specific to learning statistics with spreadsheets. Here is a slide that discusses um, content customization. The faculty that developed this found that there was a difference between the concepts and how they used it in Excel, so she and her colleague adapted this book with a content customization. The faculty member found out that translating the concepts into practice was a barrier, so they revised the book to give examples with Excel baked right in, and it worked better for the students. So this is an example of how faculty members can meet the needs of specific groups of students by customizing an open textbook. Here, the open textbook on the left is one that was created by Rice University from the OpenStax platform. The book on the right is a derivative of the book on the left made by BC Campus, which is a Canadian edition. This is the same book, but it's edited in a Canadian edition. So sometimes people may laugh, but if you, if you ask what's different, it could be the spelling, the language use, or the society or even the customs. If you were a Canadian student learning from an American book, wouldn't that be off-putting? So Creative Commons licenses allow this customization. Can Canadian students shouldn't have to learn sociology in the U.S. context, but by making a Canadian edition, it allows the students within the context that they're familiar with. To wrap up my part of the presentation, I want to leave you with using OERs, which is Open Education Resources, to facilitate access to learning. So Creative Commons licensing enables free access to open education resources, including open textbooks. As students learn remotely, access to education becomes even more important in order to stay connected and to continue making progress on their educational goals. Open education offers these benefits. First, the instructor can distribute an OER widely because of the CC license. OERs save students money because they can be downloaded once and they're available forever. You can even print out an OER. OERs can even be modified to include better content, make it more culturally relevant, and empowering faculty members and students in their learning outcomes. OERs are highly accessible and can be modified to meet faculty goals. Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to our next presenter, Andrea Alexander, and thank you so much. Thanks, Angela. Hi, everyone. Uh, today, I'm excited to share with you all Lewis's two open and affordable learning programs, both of which have substantial OER and AER content. And so I hope you find them as user friendly and helpful as I have in discovering new curriculum resources. I'm going to turn off my camera and share my screen right now. I'll start with um, three slides only by way of introduction and then launch directly into a demonstration of exactly how to use these two tools. So if you could bear with me just for a second. And if you can't see my screen, give me a, a shout. <laughs> okay. So there are actually two programs that Lewis has uh, introduced to uh, help faculty discover OERs and AERs, and that's the OER Commons and the Faculty Portal. Um, 
as you know, you'll be getting a uh, this deck of slides uh, tomorrow in an email, so you don't need to remember how to get there. Uh, you can just click this link uh, from within the slides. I'll do that right now. This is their affordable learning programs uh, page. And you can see that both of the, uh, uh, the OER Commons repository is here and the faculty portal uh, database with a search widget is also on this, this page. You can also, of course, just uh, go to Google and uh, Google Lewis Affordable Learning uh, Programs to, to get to that page. So we're going to start with the OER Commons, and um, I will spend almost all of my time um, showing you and giving you a tour and demonstrating uh, this repository because it's just so wonderful. There's so much to it. Um, it is a microsite of OERcommons.org, so you can actually, um, here's another place for you to be able to discover uh, OER materials. It's just on the, um, the OERcommons.org website. Um, so I want you to be aware of that. But just a little bit of a backstory about the Lewis OER Commons. It, of course, is a, a statewide uh, Louisiana platform for discovery, collaboration, curation, and authoring of uh, open educational resources. Uh, Lewis initiated this program in 2018. Uh, because they realized uh, the need that faculty across the state had to have a go-to uh, resource in this state for uh, discovery of OERs and AERs. So from 2018 to 2020 was the development phase. Uh, Lewis recruited academic librarians from around the state. They teamed up. They curated materials. That initial set of materials that populated this repository was was selected from uh, content providers around the country, mostly universities. Um, in addition, the librarians also aligned at least a thousand of the materials to the Louisiana uh, Common Course Catalog matrix. Let's have a look at that, just to make sure you're familiar with it. We'll look at the most updated version, of course. Um, and it's simply um, a list of the most common courses in the state. Uh, they've been given a common descriptor, each one, um, a rubric, uh, four-letter uh, rubric designation, and, of course, a uh, four-digit course number uh, for easy reference and alignment. If you are exploring um, this repository and you, you actually have the option for aligning the, uh, any of the resources to these common courses. So um, let's go ahead and look at launch into the OER Commons. And of course, the most important and urgent need is just to be able to find and discover OERs. And I love the way this, um, this repository has so many uh, browsing um, access points and menus up here. We'll start with the Discover menu. If you click on Resources, you see that all the resources are organized not only by subject, but also by material type. Um, at this point, um, full courses, course modules, and textbooks make up, you know, the, the, the most of the materials, but I'm sure this has only, you know, been online for a year, so these other material types will, will continue to increase. You can also browse by collection. Not as easy to do. They're, they're organized by topic, but uh, there's over 160 of them. Um, I had to use my browser find tool here just to, to pull up the um, collections with the word business. You can also browse by content provider. As I said, in the, uh, the development phase, um, the Lewis librarians um, selected material from content providers, mostly universities, as you can see, from around the country. Um, just want to point out that two of the largest contributors, Angela was talking about Rice University. They have over 1,000 resources here. MIT, almost 2,000. Um, um, John Hopkins School of Public Health, at least 100. And Lewis, of course, has contributed their own resources, which we'll look at right now uh, from the hub interface. 
So the Hobbs is probably the easiest way to navigate this site. Um, it's by mostly organized by academic discipline. However, there is a Lewis funded materials hub, which I think is useful to know about. Um, all the syllabi collect in this collection have been aligned to the Louisiana Common Course Catalog. There's course materials collection, and there's also a peer reviewed uh, collection of materials. Uh, going back to our hub page, you'll see there's also an OER support materials hub, which could be very useful to you going forward if you're very interested in learning more about open educational resources. They have this hub with lots of resources. So you can also browse by group. Let's look at all of the groups. Um, the groups are divided into curation groups and into user groups. The curation groups were very active uh, during the development phase when materials were initially being selected. Um, they're not going to be as active going forward. Um, some of the user groups don't yet have members, but uh, you can make a difference there. I'll just show you what one of the one of the groups looked like. The curation groups, uh, because they've been so active, are another way to browse content because there are a lot of resources that are, um, you know, uh, linked to their group page. <clears throat> and of course, you can find out about other members, connect with them, information about the group, recent activity by the group, discussions, and so forth. Let me take you back to the home page. Um, because, of course, you can browse, but there you can do a, a good old fashioned um, keyword search to find content as well. Um, it's best to keep your keywords just one or two words or phrases representing um, broad subjects or disciplines. I'll use biology. Of course, you can select these limiters from these limiters here. I really want to point out the course alignment limiter again if you want only. Uh, resources that have been aligned to that Louisiana uh, Common Course Catalog, you need to select that here. I'll leave it deselected. And before I conduct the search here, I want to show you the advanced search page um, because it's really useful and we'll, there's a specific use for it that we'll look at in just a minute. But in the meantime, you can see that it's really extensive limiting you can do here. And you see just how seriously Lewis takes, um, you know, as far as a variety of material types. Um, that they, you can select, they encourage you to submit a variety of uh, formats, uh, standards of accessibility, and of course, just um, awareness of the different license types of resources found in this repository. Last thing here that's interesting, the content source limiter. Um, remember, during the development phase, most of the materials were selected from content providers around the country. Now, of course, it's been a year and, of course, um, the push is to get more uh, open author submissions. That would be you, um, perhaps, going in and authoring your own resource and adding it to this, um, to this repository. So let me go back to the basic search here and get some results. And I'm sure you're wondering, well, this is an open resource. How do I get full text? How do I see the content? Um, of course, you know, we'll open one of these records to do that, but um, I like how in the previews, you know, they immediately indicate to you what is the um, permissions for the resource. For this one, for example, you can only share it. It's no derivatives allowed. Um, so it's not a source that you could remix or adapt. Um, however, this one has conditions that you would have to meet, but you could remix it. And this is an unrestricted, uh, unrestricted uh, use where you could also remix. Um, let's open one of these results. And of course, you get a description of the resource here with more uh, details about the license. If you want to view the full text, you can always click on View Resource. And um, that may take you directly to the full text. Um, or it may take you to another page where you see uh, a PDF and a download option. But anyway, um, full text is found through the, the view resource button here. And of course you can, you can save it to a folder that you've created. You can share this to a Google Classroom space. You use that. Um, I wanna talk next about how to add feedback to the resources in this repository. And by doing that, you really add value to the content and help peers and colleagues and faculty around the state. Um, so of course you can rate an item 
If you scroll down, you can leave a comment about an item. And of course, there's always a delete option. You can add a topic tag about an item. Um, but the two more interesting ways to leave feedback, and I think more helpful to, to your peers, uh, you can add an alignment tag here. So you see that this course is already aligned to the Louisiana Common Course CBIO 4561. But you can add a second or even a third alignment tag. Um, of course, you select the catalog, you select the subject area, um, and then you would select the appropriate uh, alignment tag from that Common Course catalog. Last but not least, you can leave feedback by evaluating a resource. Um, and I really love the way they've done this. I mean, they make it so easy for you by embedding all of these different links and videos and rubrics um, within a feature like this, you know, to help you uh, know what you're doing. <laughs> and so um, to evaluate a resource, there's seven different criteria you can use. You don't have to use all seven, but you have, um, have that option of, of evaluating on seven different criteria. Of course, you can get an overview of the rubrics used here. They were provided by a national nonprofit education organization called Achieve OER. You can learn more about that group here. Let's just start evaluating. Um, and so but it opens up to the first criteria, which is degree of alignment to standards. First thing you would do is watch the rubric, which is a um, few minutes of video. Learn about that rubric and the standards used to evaluate for this criterion. Uh, give it a rating, if you like, a comment. Um, save and go to the next criterion to evaluate. Watch that rubric video. Give your rating um, or clear it. <laughs> comment or clear. Save and go to the next. And again, you don't have to do all seven. Whenever you're finished here, you can view your results and see what you've done. And so I only evaluated on the very first uh, standard, the degree of alignment. I gave it a rating of three and I left a comment here. You haven't yet published it until you've clicked finalize OER review, which I'm not gonna do. Um, now, you have the option to leave a lot of feedback and you may want to remain anonymous. Well, you can do that. If you come up to the top right, the double person icon where your account is, and go to my items, you can um, then, let's see here. I'm sorry, not my items. I'm getting ahead of myself. You would go to account settings, and then you have privacy settings here where you can either allow everybody to see what you've rated, evaluated, or comments on, or remain anonymous for all the content that you post. So that should increase everybody's comfort level. <laughs> okay, um, we've talked about finding resources. We talked about leaving feedback and adding value to this repository by doing so. Last but not least, I saved the best for last actually, is whenever you want to create a resource and add it to this repository. There's three different ways to do it. The first two ways is very simple. You just cl click the Add OER button here. And you can submit an existing resource from the web just by adding the link. And I'm just gonna use our, our library um, URL there and continue, but you can't just add a link and be done with it. You have to, for all of these methods of adding a resource, you have to uh, be, there's due diligence. You have to uh, not only write it and link it, but you have to uh, describe it. Um, so, um, The stars next to required um, descript descriptive um, content. Notice that you have to uh, indicate what is the uh, licensing permission of this resource. You can view the resource by clicking on the link that you provided. Um, select what is the license. If you don't still don't know, just click I don't see any of these. Um, I'll just fill out the important required options here, the subject area. Uh, there's really nothing for corresponding to my material type, so I'll do that. Um, for media formats, be sure to add as many as do apply. 
not just one. And language, and we are good there. Let's continue. Okay, and then at this point, if you wanted to edit a little bit more, tweak it, add an image, and then submit it for review. So that's the first way you can add open content to this repository. Let's go back to add OER. What if you want to create a standalone uh, resource of your own? We will do that. I'm going to create a syllabus, um, enter a title here, add an image. I'm not going to add the section name. Usually main content or instructor notes, one of those two is required. Um, And let's say that I wanted to add a heading um, and I decided I'm going to format it here. And then I remember, you know, in this online virtual uh, teaching environment, there are new accessibility um, requirements. I may not know them all, but I can certainly check them with this handy accessibility checker which will tell me if I've done anything wrong. And of course I have. <laughs> so um, you get feedback of, about your mistake. And then I just clicked on the quick fix. And now I get this uh, message up here saying the document no longer has any accessibility issues or problems. So I love that accessibility checker. I think it's, it's a wonderful um, tool. I'm gonna add this, the file, the syllabus, and then we'll preview it so you can see what this would look like when you're finished and save. I'll put a few notes. Okay, and then I'll come up here and save it. Now let's, uh, let's preview it. There's two preview modes. You have an instructor view and a student view. With the instructor view, of course, you're still going to have a lot of uh, editing uh, options. This is what it would look like. Um, if you click student view, you could also get to the student preview from there. This is what the students would see. And of course, you can save it to a folder that you've created. Notice this remix button because that's the third way that you can add content to this repository is to re remix an existing resource. And I'll do that in just a second. But uh, here you have the option within this resource to do that. Um, of course, you can still edit it, add it to your Google Space, download view, add a tag to it. All right. And um, that's the preview mode. It's still not published. You have to go back to your draft page and click next in order to uh, actually finish this up. So you notice there's some describing still left to do. I'm feeling lazy. I'm just going to type a few words here. You have to choose a license, of course. I'll choose the most generous. And once again, once again, description. The syllabus is at the bottom under class guides, English. I'm going to skip over the options, acknowledge and publish. All right, so at this point, I've published it. I can delete it. I can edit it again. Um, I want to point out that you can also delete from your account. So if I go back up to my account, go into my items, I'll see the resource, whether it's a draft or a published, I'll see it and I can delete it permanently. Okay, um, the last way to add an OER is to remix one already in the repository. Now, you can't do that by clicking the Add OER button. You have to actually go back to the home page. So let's do that. And you have to go into Advanced Search. And um, I mean, it's not hard, but you do need to limit a little bit. I'm going to type in my keyword to find biology resources that can be remixed. So first limiter is the content source. Even though all the resources in this repository are open, not all of them have the same license, not all of them have the same permissions. So it, the way it is is that you have to um, select the open author resources in order to remix. 
Um, under license types, you need to select the most, um, the, the top two here that give you permission to remix a resource. Let's search and get a list of results. Um, all right. And of course, if you have permission to remix it, you'll see a remix button. You can also see that button if you click view resource and there's a remix this resource button up here. So you're remixing an existing resource. This is a syllabus. The original author had put a heading, some text, and four document attached files here. So you may want to start with just remixing or editing or changing what she or he has put in. So you can come over here to where it says syllabus, add a heading. It's really the second heading, so I'll put heading two. Add subheadings. Of course, you can click directly in here at any point to add text. You can format the headings or different colors. I may want to change that. Um, so after you've uh, edited the existing portion of this resource, you can add new stuff. Click Add New Unit. Uh, there's the heading. You can just... Um, Let's see, um, add new unit, uh, unit three. Okay, add heading, add subheading, go through all of that um, song and dance again. <laughs> so once you're finished the writing portion, let's click next step and describe. Uh, you always have to describe. This is the existing description for the existing part of the resource, which of course you can change, edit any way you like. You just added, or I just added, um, two additional units. I would click the down arrow in order to describe those two new units. Um, then next step would be to submit. This is the last, uh, the last thing you have to do is to describe the license and the permissions. So will you allow modifications? Will you allow commercial uses? What is the jurisdiction of this source? And then you can publish it. And I like the fact that it has a version history here. So you can actually see that my resource was remixed from the name of the original resource. So that gives some version tracking and some interesting history, you know, to this new resource that I just created. Again, you can delete it here or you can go into your account and delete it. Okay, so um, that I think is is it for the uh, Lewis OER Commons uh, repository. Um, open resources for you to explore. Um, I want to now, uh, let's go to the uh, faculty portal. I'm going to go back to the Affordable Learning Programs page and we'll take just a look at the faculty portal for just a few moments. Um, again, broad keywords. Uh, interesting thing about this faculty portal, it has been around a couple years more than the OER Commons. Lewis um, rolled this out in around 2017. Um, it's a nice uh, complement to the OER Commons because 95% of the content is affordable resources, not open, but affordable. But that said, you can look at these limiter options. It does have five, about 5% 5 OER content and the rest um, are affordable ebooks, um, DRM free with multiple and unlimited user licenses that you can request to be purchased. So let's first just look at the OER options. Um, if you select OER only, then you'll see the option to preview and adopt the book. Let's click that. From here, I can preview, get to the full text. Um, here you see download and PDF options, book license. Also to point out that there's usually a rights link. If you click on the rights link, you can get specific details about this item's uh, license. Um, if you want to get a course friendly link to this ebook, this open ebook, then you would fill out this short form um, and, and, and get that response um, by filling out that form. Now let's go back and uh, look at one more thing concerning open resources in, the, in this uh, database that I want you to be aware of is that 
the full ebook may not always be available. It may be open, but still you may only be getting one or two chapters. And this first result is an example of that. Also, you can usually confirm that it's an open resource. You don't have to rely on the limiter, but confirm by looking at the content provider here. It usually has the word open in it, and also checking that out here under source. You see all the providers have the word open in them, in their names. So let me deselect that, and let's now limit for only the eBooks available for purchase, which is the vast majority of this database. Um, and so you get a different option here. You get the request to purchase link instead. However, it's the same form. It goes to Paul over in the uh, acquisitions department, and he will respond to you with an email if you request him to uh, purchase a book for you. If you click open the uh, any of the results, of course, this is not open, so you're not going to see any full text access link in the record like you would with an open resource. You'll just see the request to purchase link. Um, let's go back. One other thing about these uh, affordable or AER eBooks is that um, the content providers usually have, are, um, have DRM free in their names. So again, if you look at the source here, you'll see that DRM free, DRM free, you know, um, they're mostly DRM free and uh, unlimited or multiple user license licenses, excuse me. Um, so that concludes my demonstration of these two resources. Just remember, um, if you want to if you want to explore them both, you can just Google Lewis Affordable Learning Programs um, or just wait till tomorrow. Uh, you'll get the slide deck and um, I have all of that linked in my part of the presentation and the slides.